What's going on with Okay. All right. So now we are recording and let me go over here. We have been discussing for a long time about hydraulic fracturing and we said that our objective and our conceptual idea of multi-stage hydraulic fracture is to have several fractures uh, one next to, the, to each other uh, to take advantage of the <laughs> surface of the fractures to be uh, to have more surface in area in contact with the reservoir. The more surface you have in contact with the reservoir, the easier it's for a molecule of fluid to get to the wellbore, right? So for example, if you were a molecule of oil that is sitting somewhere over here, uh, in order to get to the wellbore or eventually to the wellhead, instead of going all the way through here to that wellbore, you just go over there, get to the hydraulic fracture, which is sort of a highway, and get into another bigger highway. Uh, probably this will be a farm, and, uh, farm to market road, the hydraulic fracture, and then you get to the highway, which is actually the wellbore, and then you go up to the wellhead. But that's the whole idea, to make the, the, the road shorter and easier for the oil and gas to get into the well um, This is our conceptual idea, and that's how sometimes we design this fracture. But as I was telling you, uh, now uh, we have some tools that allow us to see a little bit better about what is, what is going on in the subsurface. And it's not, it's not as simple as that conceptual image that I showed before. And uh, thanks to microseismicity, we can get an idea about where the fracture goes and uh, also where that fracture stimulates the formation. Uh, when I say stimulate, I also say that there are some uh, pre-existing fractures or planes of weakness that when you put the fracture, you change the stresses around the fracture. Remember that opening this fracture is going to change the stress around the fracture. And that's going to cause some small planes of weakness to reactivate in shear. And this reactivates in shear. Let me add some sperity to this fracture. It would be easier for those fluid also to flow now, not only through those uh, main fractures, but also to these reactivated fractures. All of the volume that you see in which you can get to see some uh, micro seismic activity. That's, the, that, that's what is called the stimulated reservoir volume. So all of this, and this is one of the questions I have in the homework, uh, is going to call the stimulated reservoir volume. And that gives you a rough idea about uh, how far your hydraulic fractures went and uh, what you may expect for uh, production. Uh, yes? So you just get the area of it, or like how do you get the volume? Uh, you multiply by the, the thickness. Um, here I'm making a plot in, uh, in two dimensions, a top view, right? But if you were to see this from the side, and this is your Payson, and, and these are your expected uh, fractures. Uh, now we're, we're looking from the, from the side, right? This is a side view. Uh, very likely you'll get to see that also you see micro seismicity here, and ideally it should be limited to your uh, formation paper. but sometimes it also goes a little bit further away and especially in this case as we see that here we have a fault probably that fault is going to cut through uh, not only the, the the pay but a little bit further else and I, I did that with blue I don't have blue today uh, so let me do it just with green but in addition to that micro seismic over here probably in that case you will see that you also see micro seismicity uh, somewhere else. But 
uh, also this cloud, if you see it in three dimensions, uh, you'll get to see how far also it goes in uh, length or in depth. And for example, in the, in the homework, I just gave you, I'm not giving you that other view, but I'm just telling you to assume what is the depth. And then you multiply the area by the depth, and you will get the volume. So uh, the story here is that, uh, as you may uh, expect, uh, many people have worked on trying to correlate what is the size of the stimulated reservoir volume and what is the impact of, of that on the cumulative production. Uh, so that would be the integral of the rate with time, right? So cumulative production as a function of stimulated reservoir volume. And it turns out that in, in many cases, you it's not a perfect, right? But you can of sort of find a, a correlation that the bigger the stimulated reservoir volume, uh, the larger the, the cumulative production is. So if you were to calculate this stimulated reservoir volume, uh, multiply that times porosity, times saturation, and times the recovery factor, in principle, you will be able to predict what is the, the cumulative production. Uh, however, there are some cases, and uh, uh, this microseismicity is, is not a magic tool. It helps a lot, but it's not, it's not everything. There are cases in which you see very little microseismicity and you see lots of production and uh, there are some other cases in which uh, you see a lot of microseismicity, but not much uh, production. Th those cases are there, right? And, uh, and those are linked uh, to here something which is called uh, a seismic sleep. Sometimes you could have a reactivation, but your fractures will not emit uh, seismicity. This is similar. You remember when we were talking about ductile and brittle, that sometimes some rocks, and you heard that in the lab, right? That if they break very quickly, they make a loud noise. But sometimes if you were to test something at a higher confining stress or a softer rock, sometimes it just keeps on getting stronger and stronger. And, and this case will co correspond to that one, that you may not have seismicity, you may not have a loud noise coming from the rupture of the rock, but still you may be getting stimulated. And in some of these cases, you may have a lot of seismicity, uh, but, but probably your fractures are not well connected or uh, there wasn't as much uh, uh, oil or, or pressure in order to drive uh, the fluid in order to have a production. But in general, uh, the bigger the stimulated reservoir volume, the bigger the amount of, of cumulative. Uh, reserves. Okay, so th this is mostly everything you need to know for uh, solving the homework. And uh, if you're again, if you're interested on this micro seismicity topic, if you know that, that you want to work on unconventional in the future, I strongly recommend that you read that article that I put the link for in the in the homework. All right, so we're gonna move now to the next topic. We are done with uh, hydraulic fracture. The next topic is, and the last topic of the course is going to be reservoir depletion. And in particular, we want to see what is the evolution of stresses, uh, the evolution of porosity, and uh, one more end, and permeability with depletion. Okay, and now it's going to be very useful uh, for us. And now we know about hydraulic fracturing. We know about leak of tests. Uh, we, we can take a look uh, a, li a little bit more uh, closely at what is going on with reservoir depletion. Um, and before I start talking about this, let me share with you a real example about this 
a topic of reservoir depletion stress path. So let me see. I think I downloaded that. Yes. Okay. This is a paper that talks about uh, what is a reservoir stress path. That would be how stresses vary in a, in the North Sea. Informations that are very uh, very soft. These chalk oil fields, they have a very large porosity and uh, are very soft. So uh, if you increase a little bit the stress, they compact quite a bit. And what we want to see over here, so so this this is the, the fields that we're going to be looking at. Uh, what we're going to be looking at here is this. So let's see what's going on here. Let me try to go here full screen. Um, let's try to understand what's going on here. Um, this, is, this is a reservoir with the initial pore pressure uh, somewhere over here. And after some time, they start, as always, you know, as you will do, to deplete the reservoir. So you lower the pressure in order to produce more fluids. Uh, every so often, they will do a hydraulic fracture test in order to measure what is the minimum principal stress. So we already know that that with hydraulic fracture tests, we can measure the minimum principal stress. And that's, wh that's what they do, right? At the same location. And at the same location, uh, they see that that minimum principal stress decreases with pore pressure. What do you think is going on? Uh, why, why is this uh, reservoir stress pad going like that? So this is the horizontal stress. Uh, be, be, before trying to answer that, what about the total stress, the overburden stress? Is that going to change with reservoir depletion? Yes. Uh, why? No, pore pressure is decreasing. Oh, okay. See, yeah, all the time here is decreasing. So you see, we go, this is time zero. <coughs> this time zero, and it moves to to the left. Uh, this is a little bit confusing, but <laughs> but this one is moving in this direction. Uh, so do you think the overburden on top of the reservoir is going to change? So by depleting the reservoir, will, will you change the weight of the rock on top? Will you change the amount of water on top? This is an offshore case. Not very likely, right? Uh, so the total weight on the reservoir is going to be always the same. That total vertical stress is going to be always pushing down. And it's not, it's not going to change. Uh, there are some cases in, in, in which it can change, but, but let's forget about that, those special cases for now. But look, the total horizontal stress, the minimum principal stress, it does change with depletion. And, and this is because uh, you're lowering the pore pressure, and, uh, and this is the total stress. So. The result of this is that with depletion, uh, every time your total stress is going to decrease a little bit. And this is what we're trying to understand. And this is going to be very important because when, uh, and this is a, actually a problem right now uh, for unconventionals, because usually unconventionals are deeper than conventional fields, right? Because the source rock was the one that, that sent uh, those hydrocarbons to the conventional formations. So when you want to get to the unconventionals, you need to get through the conventionals. And if those are depleted, that's going to cause quite a bit of problems uh, for drilling because the minimum principal stress is very low. Mr. Ewan. Um, <coughs> does sigma B also decrease? Like, SP is not going to decrease, but what about the effective vertical stress? That's exactly what we're going to get into now in trying to explain how effective stress are going to change and how total stress are going to change. So this, this, this is the key on understanding this problem of depletion, understanding both the total stresses and the effective stresses. And I can tell you that effective stresses are going to increase always. Yes? So in this case, um, SH min would change, but SP wouldn't change. Correct, correct. 
So here you have another interpretation. Uh, it's a similar plot, but you can clearly see, and this is all real data, okay? This is all uh, tests in which you measure the minimum principal stress and you see that as you lower the pore pressure, the uh, minimum principal stress goes down. All right, so let's try to explain that. Uh, in this case, what we're going to assume is that, uh, uh, let's make a, a plot similar to the one that we had for the North Sea. <coughs> we have the reservoir at some depth. Uh, let's assume that that reservoir is uh, limited by two faults. And here we're going to be decreasing the pore pressure. And uh, as I was telling you before, well, here, let me add a, a cap rock. The vertical stress, the total vertical stress, is not going to change. Uh, you're changing here uh, what is the uh, pore pressure inside. You're getting mass out of this, but everything on top, it's, it's not going to change. So the vertical stress uh, is going to be uh, constant. Uh, in addition to this, uh, we're going to be producing fluids out of here. And as you produce fluids out of here, uh, you will expect that as a function of time, your pore pressure inside the reservoir is going to to go down, right? So this, this is our assumption, that pore pressure goes down. Um, okay, so the first thing that we need to do uh, here is to try to simplify a little bit the problem to something that we can solve easily uh, with uh, a few equations. And the first thing uh, we're going to do is, is we're going to simplify this problem just to one dimension, um, which is actually an assumption that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what we're going to say is that the rock, a piece of rock in this reservoir, is going to undergo what we have seen already, uh, which is called a one-dimensional strain path. And what that means is that uh, this uh, piece of rock uh, is going to <coughs> be formed only on one direction. And in this case, this is going to be uh, the vertical direction, right? So let me do it with another color. So if this, this was the original volume, after depletion, the volume is not going to change in the lateral direction, but it's just going to change in the other direction. And this kind of makes sense because uh, this reservoir, we assume, assume it to be much longer than its height. And under those conditions, uh, you'll expect to see uh, very little uh, deformation on the, on the other side. All right, so uh, let me make here a, a bigger volume of, of this, just to make it a little bit clearer. And let's put here a coordinate system to help us in writing these strains. So we have one, two, three. If the original height is H, and after depletion, your <coughs> reservoir shrinks in vertical direction, distance delta H, uh, what is going to be the strain epsilon 3, 3? I know you guys can tell me this. So what is going to be the strain in the vertical direction? It's 
it's going to be the deformation, no. the change of length, over right? H. Over H. And uh, we're saying also that the deformations on the other two directions are going to be zero. So here uh, we can see direction one, but I'm assuming that also it's the same in direction number two, okay? Or that this one extends quite a, a bit uh, longer than the height in direction number two. So those other two strains uh, are also going to be zero. So uh, before we get into the equations, uh, what what's going on in here? Why uh, this uh, is going to affect uh, the process of uh, depletion. Well, as this one gets shorter, uh, with a decrease of, of pore pressure, uh, we're going to have a deformation. A deformation is going to <coughs> cause compaction. Compaction, uh, by definition, it's a decrease of porosity. And a decrease of porosity uh, is going to cause what do you think? Decrease in permeability. A decrease in permeability, right? It depends on the type of rock uh, that you uh, analyze. Uh, sometimes it can be very strong, sometimes it can be mild, but it depends on the type of rock and depends also on the level of compaction. Uh, also, uh, when we, we do compaction, we're going to see in a bit that we're going to increase the effective stress. And if you increase uh, effective stresses, especially if you have a fractured rock in which the width of the fracture is WF, as you increase stresses, permeability is going to go down quite a bit. Uh, so, from the point of view of permeability, uh, this is this is not going to this is not going to be good. And uh, also, uh, if we have the reservoir shrinking in one direction, this deformation is going to bring also all the formations that were on top lower. Right? This is what is called subsidence. And uh, as a result of that, let me add a little bit of color here, make it obvious. If this surface go goes down, this rock is going to go down to, this surface might go down to, this which is called subsidence, or some people call it subsidence. I heard those two. And if you have this piece of rock going down to notice that also you might reactivate some faults so so it it, it can be it can be a big problem uh, if you do not know how to to quantify in in advance so so this is the objective uh, we want to calculate uh, how much the reservoir is going to be is going to get smaller uh, we want to calculate how much <coughs> porosity is going to decrease, how much effective stresses are going to increase in order to know if that's going to have a big impact on permeability. So sometimes this problem of depletion can have just uh, implications inside the reservoir. Some other times can have implications outside the reservoir, subsidence or uh, full reactivation uh, near, the, near, the, near the reservoir. There's actually some data, interesting data that you see that uh, as some reservoirs are depleted, sometimes you start to see seismic activity. That's because you're altering the state of stress uh, around the reservoir. Okay, so let's go to the questions now, okay? Now that we have uh, the conceptual problem. Uh, in order to solve this problem, we're going to see something new, uh, something that we haven't seen before. It's a new concept. Uh, it's not... Uh, too difficult to understand, but it's very important for this particular problem. If you remember, uh, coming back to almost the beginning of the class, we, we talked about elasticity in three dimensions and the relationship between stresses and strains. And in order to do this, when we do, did the expansion for porous media, 
uh, we used what is called the Terzaghi's effective stress equation, which tells us that uh, effective stress is equal to total stress minus pore pressure, right? It, that's what Terzaghi says. And, and this equation works very well. Uh, however, if you want to be a little bit more accurate in calculating the formations, and that's what we're going to do right now, there is an alternative effective stress law, which is called the Biot's effective stress. This Biot guy was very smart. He was working for Shell. This is where he came out with this. And he says that effective stress is total stress minus a coefficient alpha times the pore pressure. So it's, it's a small difference. And uh, it's a more general rule of uh, effective stress. And, and you get to see, and actually we measure in the lab this uh, quite a bit, uh, we see that this value alpha is more or less from 0.4 uh, to 1, where, for example, uh, uh, porous sandstones, probably they have a value of 0.9, 0.95, uh, approaches one, the softer the rock, the, the bigger the, the bio coefficient, and if you had some very tight shales, probably this coefficient will go cl closer to 0 0.5, 0 0.4, it, it can get very low. But in general, the stiffer the rock, uh, the lower this uh, bio coefficient, and this partition between, uh, for effective stress between total stress and pore pressure, it becomes a little bit different. Okay, but the bio coefficient is, is going to be a value uh, which is uh, close to one, sometimes a little bit less if your rock is very tight. So with that, uh, now let's use this bio effective stress into this equation. And remember that here, when, when I write this uh, underline two times, I mean uh, this is a tensor and I'm writing six components in one, uh, with one symbol. So if I write now the bio effective stress for this, this is gonna be alpha, and we're going to assume that that alpha is the same in all directions, so it's an isotropic material. And this is going to be the same as before. And uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to expand this equation, which is gonna help us uh, solve what we want to solve. And here, If I write now all stresses, this is going to be S11 minus alpha PP, S22 minus alpha PP. Oh, I don't know why I'm writing two Ps. Uh, S33 minus alpha PP, same as with the uh, uh, Terzaghi effective stress. Shear stresses, S12, S13, and S23, they are not affected by pore pressure, right? And here, uh, now I can write uh, the stiffness matrix, which if we assume linear uh, elasticity and an isotropic material, it's gonna be equal to this, and times I guess by t by now, guys, you may have forgotten about this, but we're using it one more time. And remember this, like this, these are zeros, and these are uh, some value that I don't remember, but we don't need it anyways, so we're not gonna write them. And here we have the strains. Okay, so uh, what, do we, what do, do we want to know now? Uh, we want to know what is going to be the variation of effective stresses and total stresses 
with the variation of uh, pore pressure. Uh, so let's see uh, how we can simplify this problem. Uh, first of all, remember that from here, uh, we said that the strains in the horizontal direction are going to be zero, right? So epsilon one, one, zero, epsilon two, two is zero. Uh, with this problem of strain in one direction and no shear strains either, these two, three are also zeros, okay? So at the end, I just have just one value which is not zero. So let's use the third equation and if we want to compute from here uh, what is this strain epsilon 3 3 I'm gonna get it straight out of this equation and epsilon 3 3 is just going to be this divided by that right so this divided by that and this is uh, and that's it let me simplify this uh, a little bit what is going to be uh, the derivative of epsilon 3 3 with respect to pore pressure why, why let, let me tell you uh, before we get into the math we said that the overburden s33 this is the one that's coming in the vertical direction that's going to be constant <coughs> so I know that one is going to be constant and I know that my pore pressure is the one that's going to vary so this is just a, an elastic parameter it's constant this is going to be constant and this is the one that is going to vary so I'm interested in knowing what is going to be the variation in epsilon 3 3 divided a variation in pore pressure can you guys make that derivative and le let me tell you one more thing in order to simplify this mm -hmm. I'm going to call all these things and something this is what we already know this is the constraint modulus m so I, I could write here derivative or partial derivative is the same the variation epsilon 3 3 with variation in pore pressure uh, that's going to be what is m constant 2 m constant 2 uh, yeah, uh, yes yes m is constant it's a property of the material that we assume it doesn't change uh, with uh, with pore pressure or with the stress it is a linear elastic material isn't this just one over young modulus? no, you're missing something negative alpha m negative alpha divided by m okay. right? because m, m is down, down here uh, and basically now we have the solution for uh, telling what is going to be the strain due to variation of pore pressure uh, PP right it's just going to be the uh, BO coefficient uh, divided the constraint modules yes so why are we assuming sigma uh, sorry epsilon 1 1 and epsilon 2 2 to be 0 wouldn't there be like any elongation in the other side no because we're assuming that this one it's uh, very very long and if <coughs> you have the stress coming down in this direction uh, if this one tries to expand in that direction you, you, that won't be possible because you have the same piece of rock right next to it that is always trying to do also trying to do the same so if, you, if they all try to expand no one will expand uh, ju just imagine just for a minute that you're adding more stress to this and they, this one tries to expand due to the Poisson effect if it's alone over there it might expand but we know that we have more rock next to it if they all try to expand no one is going to be able to to expand all right so 
we have then now the, the first equation that we need in order to tell what is going to be the strain uh, in uh, due to a decrease in port pressure. And uh, I think it would be a good idea to start with the example. So, so we have an equation, let's try to apply it. Uh, let me get to this example. Uh, so in my example, we're going to have a reservoir which has a height of 100 meters. It's a tight gas reservoir and it's also uh, fractured. So there are fractures in here. Uh, we're depleting. <coughs> this reservoir and so the depth of four kilometers we're going to assume that our reservoir rock it's uh, as we said is a fractured sandstone its porosity is 0.21 bio coefficient is 0.9 Yam modulus is 2 million psi Poisson ratio is 0.17 and when you do the production uh, we'll assume that we're lowering the pore pressure by a very large amount of 35 MPa Notice that this is a negative variation, right? Because your final pressure is smaller than your initial pressure. So the variation should be, should be negative. So question number one, and this is, we already have the equation for that. Uh, my question is, what is the value of delta H at the top of the reservoir? Can you please calculate that? So here you have the equation for the strain, right? And we said that the delta H is just going to be this. It's going to be that uh, settlement at the top of the reservoir divided the height of the reservoir. <coughs> So in order to solve this problem, as always, I recommend that you go to the SI units. That's going to be easier. So you, you need to convert that modulus from million PSI to gigapascals or, or, or megapascals. That's going to be easier because your production data is in megapascals. And uh, you should be able to solve Okay. So I'll give, you, I'll give you two minutes in order to solve that. Is the, the delta E33 different than E33? Uh, not really. In this case, it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same thing. Uh, the delta just means a variation. <coughs> but if the in initial strain was zero, then the variation is just going to be that absolute number. So let me see. Let me help you guys with class participation. Who doesn't have class participation here? Mm. Daniel, are you here? Yeah, can you solve the problem? Yeah. Okay. Uh, West Memphis, I always forget. I always get confused with Long Island. 
Long Beach, Long Beach, California. Uh, there, there, there are some very thick uh, reservoirs uh, which are relatively shallow uh, in which production of, of oil uh, went as far as producing a subsidence on the surface. I mean, on the surface, really, on the city of, of, of uh, Long Beach, of tens of feet. So, so the surface went down quite significantly. In some of these uh, offshore uh, rigs in the North Sea, sometimes also they have to jack them up in order to uh, maintain the original elevation because uh, the seafloor, it really goes down. And the opposite happens when you have injection. When you have injection, and if you increase a lot the pressure in the reservoir, uh, your surface, uh, it can move up. That's called Instead of subsidence, it's called uplift or heat. Uh, this one. This this is the only guy outside the SI system in the problem. Okay, so you have a solution, Daniel? Not yet? Okay. I'll give you the Anyone calculated what is this in in SI units? Yeah. What is the value? Uh, what E is? Yeah. Thirteen thousand seven hundred ninety-three MPA. Okay, let's say thirteen point eight gigapascals. Probably the first thing that you have to do here is to compute what is M. Okay. Uh, anyone has the value of M? 14, 14,330? 14? 14,000, 30. 200? 3,000, 3, I used 1,500 PSI at 10 MPA. I got 14.82 PSI. I have 14.82. Uh, so remember that 1 MPA is 145 PSI. Okay, next step would be to compute Epsilon 3.3. Daniel, you have the answer? I got 3,000, but that seems too high. 3,000? 
Well, but, but make sure that you take this into account, okay? These are gigapascal, these are MPAs. So th th this will be 14,800 in megapascals. Okay, um, sometimes when we talk in about strains, it's easier to talk in terms of percent or to talk in terms of thousands. So what was put together here? So in terms of percent, because doesn't the mega I, I had a mega pascal, so they cancel out. Yeah. The mega pascal will cancel out. Yeah. yeah. So then point two. Percent. Yeah. Point two. One two. Point two percent. So point two. One percent. Right. Yeah. That's the solution I have to. And therefore, the delta H will be equal to. This one times 100 met 100 meters, right? So this will be 0.21 divided by 100 times 100 meters because that's the the thickness of your reservoir, and this will be equal to 0.21 meter, which is how 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 much is this? It's about a foot, right? Uh, so. I hope that you can get to see that even here, very tiny deformations, when you multiply them times a huge length, they, they can be quite large deformation. In some of these reservoirs, uh, they, they are even, some of them are softer, and some of them go into grain crashing, something that we're not assuming here that would make this deformation uh, much larger. Uh, okay. Uh, if, if we have time, I'd like to come back here and talk about uh, rock compressibility. But le let's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later on, okay? Uh, but this basically, this is the rock stiffness, the inverse of that is rock compressibility. Uh, but I'll come back to that, to that later on. So, yes? So back to that one quick, why is it point 0.21 over 100 and not just 20 over 100? This one? Yeah. So. It's 20%, right? So it should just be 20 over 100? Yeah. So it's 0.21%. Oh. Yeah. Okay, uh, so this will be 0.21 divided by 100, right? Uh, okay, so, so we answered the first question, okay? What is the, the subsidence of the top of the formation? You can continue doing a, a little bit of math over here. And, and you will see that uh, similar as uh, we showed before, now we use the, the first and third uh, equations. Uh, you will show that the uh, horizontal stress, sigma 1, 1, effective horizontal stress, is equal to something that we know very well so far, Poisson ratio divided one minus Poisson ratio, the vertical stress. And because of this, our uh, total horizontal stress, uh, S11, is going to be equal to this. Now we apply the Biot equation plus alpha pp, okay? So you see this one, this alpha pp just went to the other side, and this is the same as that. And now uh, what, uh, what we can do is we can calculate the same as we did before. Remember that this guy is going to be constant. All the material properties are going to be constant too. The only thing is going to change is the pore pressure. So we can do the same thing that we did before and ask ourselves what is going to be the variation of the horizontal stress with the variation of pore pressure. Uh, so basically 
where is the variable pore pressure? It is here and it is there, right? So this is going to be equal to uh, minus alpha uh, times this plus alpha and alpha is going to be a common factor and uh, this is going to be equal to 1 minus 2 Poisson ratio divided 1 minus <coughs> Poisson ratio and this is a coefficient that we're going to call coefficient A so now this equation tells us what is going to be the variation of the horizontal stress as a function of the properties of the rock and not notice that mostly it's about the Poisson ratio the coefficient is in there too but the main thing is the Poisson ratio uh, for example what would be the variation of horizontal stress if our Poisson ratio is zero with pore pressure let's say BO coefficient is 1 about 1 and Poisson ratio is 0 the coefficient A will be one. just 1 right it will tell us that the variation of horizontal stress is the same as the variation of pore pressure so notice now this equation is exactly the one that we needed in order to solve this problem you see this is the variation of horizontal stress with pore pressure and we see that this value is about for this place 0 0.77, 0 0.8, 0 0.84 uh, well now we have an equation that tells us that as a function of the of the Poisson ratio uh, so let's try a few more equations before we go uh, to the example uh, with this same equation also uh, we can say uh, what is going to be the variation instead of the total stress uh, with pore pressure, the variation of effective stress with pore pressure and that's going to be basically if this is constant, effective stress is just going to be this one minus that one so basically that this is just going to be minus alpha Poisson ratio divided 1 minus uh, Poisson ratio and since we're here let's answer one more thing uh, what is going to be the variation of so we say that S33 is equal to sigma uh, no, no let, let me write yeah well I can do this sigma 33 uh, plus alpha pp well but actually well, I, don't, I want the other one sigma 33 is s 33 minus alpha pp what is the variation of sigma 33 effective vertical stress with uh, pore pressure this is an easy one it's just alpha right so no, notice that now these equations uh, before we go into this one these equations tell us if we have a negative change in pore pressure which is a depletion negative times negative is going to be positive and that's going to mean that these both effective stresses increase the vertical stress and the horizontal stress both of those are going to increase with depletion however the total horizontal stress is going to uh, decrease this is going to be a positive number and this is going to decrease so then let's go now that we have uh, those equations L let's try to interpret according to this equation what is going to to happen when uh, we have depletion so let me move this a little bit forget a minute about effective stresses we'll come back to that later on and we're going to make a plot of what is called a total stress path 
in a total stress path similar to what you saw in that field data we have pore pressure over here and let's say that this was the initial pore pressure in the reservoir and on the y-axis we plot total stress we're going to be decreasing the pore pressure uh, what would did we say about the vertical stress with depletion we say it remains constant right so this one is, is just going to be a line that goes in that direction vertical stress and in our example S33 it remains uh, constant with time and the horizontal stress let's say this one started here and horizontal stress starts somewhere over there lower than the vertical stress is going to go down with uh, decreasing pore pressure at a rate which is proportional to this parameter A where A it's, uh, we saw that it can be as large as as one and it's usually larger than 0.5 and you calculate it uh, you calculate that with the Poisson ratio <coughs> so very important to remember then here is that the horizontal stress is going to decrease total horizontal stress is going to decrease with depletion and that's going to depend on those values so let's compute this parameter A for our example and let's try to <coughs> compute how much the total horizontal stress is going to change uh, for the example we did before so I'll, I'll keep that equation over there uh, and you have already that schematic so my second question here actually I'm going to do it in a new one a new page uh, is going to be uh, what is the variation of total horizontal stress with the depletion that we imposed okay so first I recommend that you compute this A and then your delta S1 1 is just going to be that value of A times minus 35 MPA alright I see that you, Jason, you don't have any any participation points in my notes on this. So can, can you solve this? Yeah. Okay. Are you using the same values from the... Yeah, same. Yes, same problem.
So these were the values, okay? Notice that that coefficient a is just a function of the Poisson ratio, it's not a function of the Yam module. You got the answer? Yeah, I got minus 18.6 MPA. Minus 18.6 MPA. What is your A? 0.53. Are you sure? It's 8.7. Yeah, I have the same. Uh, probably you, you inputted one number incorrectly. Yeah. Jason, please check your equation. Uh, and this results in what? And it's very important here uh, the the sign, okay? So this is a negative. It's a positive number times a negative number that will be a negative. That means that the stress uh, went down by 25 megapascal because of the reduction in pore pressure of 35 uh, megapascals. Uh, let's number three. Uh, let's compute the changes in <coughs> effective horizontal stress and effective vertical stress. Um, let's see, where were those equations? They're right here. So let me write here the equation, sigma 1, 1. So please, please let me know the answer as, as you get it. And uh, in the meantime, Is this 31.5? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this, this n no, positive. This is positive, right? Yeah. And what about this one? 6.5. Okay. So, uh, what, what the problem here is telling you is that both of those effective stresses go up. Horizontal effective stress goes up much less though than the effective vertical stress. So if you wanted to look at this in a more circle, that what, that what that would mean is that here you move about 6.4 and this point over here goes about uh, five times that, right? So five times one, two, three, something, something like this. 
So your new Mohr circle now goes from here to there. And there are two implications for this. Uh, one is that your mean stress, your mean effective stress, which is going to be the center of this circle, it moves, it moves to the right, right? So your mean stress now is higher, and uh, your if your mean effective stress is higher, you're gonna have compaction. That compaction, as we say, is going to reduce uh, the porosity and it can close fractures. And the second implication of this is the radius of your circle is now also bigger. So you have more deviatoric stress. And more deviatoric stress, uh, it can sometimes make the rock fail, especially if this more circle as we saw, if, let's let us plot the top of the of the circle here. It went into this direction, and depending what is the strength of the rock, let's say that our shear failure is somewhere over here. <laughs> depending on what is this stress path. Sometimes it can go in this direction and go into shear failure. Some more times just can go into this direction and go more into into just compaction. So sometimes with depletion, it happens that you may also have uh, a shear failure in the reservoir, and that's going to be caused principally by the Poisson ratio. Notice uh, if the Poisson ratio is equal to zero, and, and remember physically the Poisson ratio equal to zero means that when you compact <coughs> a, a, a rock, it doesn't expand to the sides. So Poisson ratio more than zero, it will expand when you compact it, but uh, equal to zero is like you compact it and it just stays the same. If you have such a rock with a very small Poisson ratio, let's say equal to zero, uh, your change of effective stress is going to be zero too. And if your change of, of effective lateral stress is equal to zero, that means at that point it's going to remain anchored over there, and this one is just going to move, and your Mohr circle is just going to get bigger and bigger, so it might run into into shear failure. But remember that rocks usually do not have a Poisson ratio equal to, to zero, and this one is going to move to the right, and effective stresses are going to increase, both of them but the horizontal stress is going to increase much less than the vertical stress. And uh, let's see, wha how are we doing with time? Uh, I think we're close to the end, but uh, I have one more thing here. I like to know what is the change in permeability assuming an equation in which k divided original uh, permeability, I, I want you to compute this number. This is a typical equation that it's used for permeability of fractured reservoirs. It's going to be the exponent of minus a fractured compressibility parameter. This, this is not B-O coefficient. Okay, let, let's just change the name so to make it clear. This is going to be uh, CF times uh, sigma H effective minus sigma H zero. So this is going to be basically, basically the change of effective horizontal stress sigma one one. And I'd like to know that for this rock in which CF is 0 0.25 1 over MPA. Can you please tell me what is that going to be? This, oh, sorry about that. 
what is going to be this uh, the new permeability for the new effective stress. And in this case, uh, I'm assuming these fractures are more or less vertical. So uh, the stresses that change the permeability are the horizontal stress, not the vertical stresses. Mr. Carson, you don't have class participation points either. Can you solve this equation? Yeah. Okay. So what this equation tells you basically is that the, the bigger the stress, the lower the permeability, and it's an exponential relationship. <coughs> so if I were to plot this, it looks something like this. It tells you that the logarithm of permeability decreases linearly with the value of effective horizontal stress. Okay, so let's say point 0.2, okay? okay? So according to our computations then in this fractured reservoir, because of depletion, we also have a decrease in permeability. The new permeability is 20% of the original permeability. And sometimes this, this is a huge issue, uh, especially for now for unconventionals. Uh, when you do hydraulic fracturing, usually your effective stresses tend to be relatively low. Your fractures tend to be open, but as you start depleting, you increase a lot of the effective stress and your fracture permeability goes down significantly. Sometimes even you can have something which is called propan embedment, in which your fractures closes so much that the propan gets embedded into the shale and it closes again. So it doesn't have that propped uh, width uh, anymore and because of that your production rates also plummet significantly all right guys i think uh we need to do a few more things about uh about this uh, uh compaction uh reservoir depletion problem but we're almost done uh so this is the plan uh, monday and tuesday you have the laboratory i'll send instruction for that on Tuesday, we're going to have the lecture. We're going to finish this, and we're going to go through the review of the previous homework and uh, questions for the exam. So that's going to be the review session. And my plan that is on Thursday, we don't have lecture, and you just study for the exam. And if you have some questions, you're welcome to stop by my office. OK? All right. OK. I'll see you next week, then.